Thanks, y'all. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to thank the, uh, the parents that were wise enough to sequester the, the kiddos this morning. Normally, I like to keep things uh, at a level for all, particularly of our, uh, our young believers who have uh, come in believer's baptism already, but this message, probably best that we sequestered them, and I appreciate y'all's wisdom in that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this time together. These that are gathered here in your name, Lord, to study your word to lift holy hands in praise and worship to you. And this is just an extension of that as we study your word. That is a component of worship as well. And we thank you for that opportunity. I pray, Lord, as we go to your word, that you would open our hearts and our minds to its truth and that we leave this place with a deeper understanding of the message, yes, but also growing in a deeper relationship with you. Fill us with your spirit so we can accomplish your purposes. We praise you. And thank you in the precious name of your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we can supplement our accountability and make no mistake, friends. You and I are accountable to each other as the local body of believers. And we can supplement that accountability to others by reading slowly through literature that is designed to challenge our Christian maturity. You and I are challenged to grow and the Great Commission tells us tells us that when it says teaching them, that's you and I, to observe all that I, Jesus, he says, have commanded you. And so consider as an example these questions that are related to sexual purity that I had to read carefully as I read through Kent Hughes' liberating ministry from the success syndrome. Here are his questions. Consider this. Are we being desensitized by the present evil world? Do things that once shocked us now pass us by with little notice? Have our sexual ethics slackened? Number two, where do our minds wander when we have nothing to do? What do we think about? Number three, what are we reading? Are there any books or any magazines or any files in our libraries or on our smartphones that we would want no one else to see? What are we renting or what are we watching on video? How many hours do we spend watching TV? How many adulteries did we watch last week on TV or in a movie? How many murders? Did we witness? How many did we watch alongside of our children or our grandchildren? Number five, how many chapters of the Bible did we read this week? Folks, we need to understand that in God's eyes, there are no degrees of sin. They're all equal. When we talk about Oh, they're a good person, or, well, they're not such a good person. In God's eyes, friends, they're all, we're, we're, you and I are all on the same level playing field. Imperfect. Imperfect. And as we consider heaven, yet if I was to ask a person, do you believe that heaven is a perfect place? Most people would say, yes, it is. If I were to ask you, and if you were to be honest with me, are you perfect? You would have to answer unequivocally, no, I'm not a perfect person. And the next question being, if heaven were to let you in, would it still be perfect? And so you see, friends, you and I have got to be perfected by the Lord God. We have to be perfected by Him. And we didn't understand that. And so our goal today is to realize that committing a sin in our hearts is no different than carrying it out in reality. In reality. To better understand what I'm talking about, if you will, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. I will be reading that if you'll follow along with me. I'll be reading out of the English Standard Version. Matthew 5. 27 through 30. It says this. 
Matthew 5, 27. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. May God add his reading, his, his blessing to the reading of his word. To set the context of the book of Matthew, as we've been discussing Matthew for the last few months now, we know that Matthew writes his gospel directed at demonstrating to Israel that Jesus Christ is their, in fact, their chosen Messiah. And he uses Old Testament scripture, and he points to Old Testament scripture, and he points to prophecies that are made in Old Testament, and he shows how Jesus fulfills all of the prophecies that point to Messiah. Jesus Christ has fulfilled those. As we've stepped into chapter 5 now, we know that it begins the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus sits down with his disciples in a manner that demonstrates that he is teaching them. He is instructing his disciples on how to live. And so chapters 5 through 7 are in fact the kingdom life discourse. In other words, Jesus Christ is saying to believers, to his disciples, and to you and I as we read the text... That this is the way that you and I are to live out our Christian life. Some would say as they look at this, well, that's pie in the sky. It's impossible. If you look at this and you read through Matthew chapter 5 through 7, no one can live up to that. It's impossible. But we have to remember also that Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. And so, friends, as we live out our Christian lives, we must live them out in surrender to the Holy Spirit. We must live them out in a, in a manner that is surrendered to the Spirit of God so that the Spirit of God can love through us. You know, we talk about sin and we're dwelling on a, a, a very prominent sin in our society today in our message this morning. And we, we talk about that in, in a way, well, you know, nobody's perfect, we say. And that's true. But when we say it that way, what we're really saying is, hey, since everybody's going to sin and nobody's perfect, it's okay. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. But Jesus takes it one step further in our text today. And let's go back to our text now, if you will. Look at verse 27 and what it says. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Friends, that's one of, the, one of the Ten Commandments. We're all familiar with the Ten Commandments. We think those are the big no-nos, and in fact they are. But since all sin is on the same level playing field, anything else that we would do, you know, even if as a three-year-old child one time someone ventured into a convenience store, grabbed a candy bar, stuck it in their pocket, and didn't pay for it, that's as, that's as devastating a sin in the eyes of God. As, as the behavior of Charles Manson and the Manson family. You think that's outrageous. God's standards are perfection. He expects you and I to be perfect. We can't be perfect in and of ourselves. And so what he's done is he sent his son to dwell, indwell us with the Holy Spirit so that he perfects us. So it says here in the text, you've heard it said, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. What is adultery? It's, it's extramarital sex with a person that is already married to someone else. Committing adultery is having a sexual intercourse with another person who is married to someone else. That's what it talks about. And he goes on to say, but I say to you, you've heard it said this. You've heard it said, we talked about this last week with murder. You've heard it said that you shouldn't do this and that their command is to not actually carry out the act. But Jesus says, but I say to you, listen, 
that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In his heart. He's committed it. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that it's no different. There's no difference between looking upon a woman with lust in your heart, desiring her if you're not married to her, than if you carried it out. There's no difference. What is he referring to? Why, why is he talking about this? Well, friends, you and I have many times addressed what I, what I term the noetic effects of sin. Many of you know this well enough to where you're nodding your heads now. You remember what it is because repetition is the mother of learning. What's the noetic effects of sin? I'm glad you asked. It's the idea that sin begins in the mind. It begins in the mind. And so what we, what we, the videos that we play in our mind eventually become the things that we carry out in actions. Our thought processes become our actions and the noetic effects of sin are carried out in our actions eventually. So if you and I are thinking about and playing the video about these, these terrible actions, eventually when the opportunity presents itself, we've, ar we've already played out how it's going to go and we just sort of carry it out. So Jesus says, not only don't carry out those actions, but don't even think about them. Don't even play that video in your mind. The mind remembers things in pictures. The mind thinks in pictures. You know, and as we looked at those questions in the, in the beginning, you know, with, with what we're filling our minds with and what we read and what we watch on TV and what we watch in videos and so forth, those be become, we become desensitized desensitized to the abomination of what it, what it is and what it, what it means. And so Jesus takes it to one step further as an analogy, and this is called a hyperbolic metaphor. You've heard me use that many times. We know that the Bible uses figurative language. This is figurative language. It's not literal. There were some monastic monks that lived hundreds of years ago that believed that this was literal. And so they were gouging their eyes out. They were cutting their right hands off. This is not what this means. It's hyperbolic metaphor. For us to go back to our English lessons in seventh grade, we know that a hyperbole is a gross exaggeration to make a point. A metaphor is a, a comparison of two unlike things for us to better understand what's being communicated. And so when Jesus says... Look down with me, if you will, in verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. How devastating would it be for you and I to tear our own eye out? A, it would be very painful. B, it would be a very great loss for us and it would, it would hinder us from, from fully functioning. But what Jesus is saying here is, friends, that it's better for you to be even hindered in your functioning, to have a devastating and painful loss in your life than it is to commit a sin. And he goes on to explain again, and what he's thinking here is the, the things that we see. If there are things in your life that you're viewing in that video in your mind, that pull you off the mark, that cause you to stumble, that cause you to fall into the noetic effects of sin, eliminate them. Don't even let them enter into your thought processes. Do not even go where, where that's going to be. Don't watch those movies. Don't watch those TV shows. Don't read about those things. Don't place yourself in those circumstances. So it's what we see, but it's not just what we see that he's talking about here. He goes on, and if you will, look, at, look with me. Verse 30, and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Not just the things that we're seeing and we're thinking about, but the things that we're doing. If there are actions in our lives that are sinful actions, he says, cut it off. If there are 
if there are circumstances in our life, perhaps where we work, perhaps the people that we associate with at our work, perhaps the people that we associate with in our social circles, perhaps there are people in our lives that are causing us to stumble, that are pulling us off the mark, that are pulling us away from our Christian walk, from our thought processes that should be setting our mind on things above. And what Jesus is saying here is, eliminate them. Eliminate them. Don't place those things in your life that will cause you to stumble. And as, as I counsel young people, unmarried young people, what I tell them is, do not find yourself in the company of someone of the opposite sex alone. Why is that? It's not a trust issue. It's this, this that's being spoken of here. Don't place yourself in the circumstances where you'll be tempted to do things that you shouldn't do. Don't even go there. And so what Jesus says is, it's better to have a devastating loss in your life than it is to commit those sins that would, be, that would cause us to stumble. So why is, why is premarital sex such a bad thing? You know, I mean, in society today, they just, people say, oh, you know, it's, 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 not, that, it's not that big a deal. Well, A, the, the, the Bible teaches, and, and the two will become one flesh. The male and female, they, he created them, and he created them one for another. And Jesus addresses divorce in the next in the next passage and he speaks about divorce and how he how he despises the divorce why why is that because he he created us friends for that one person and what why premarital sex is such a big deal is because it completely janks the relationship why is divorce so rampant in America today because we jank the relationship by making it physical before we tie together our relationship emotionally. We, we, we don't get to know each other in that physical attraction. We have no self-discipline. We're a microwave society, and so we want it now. And so we just consummate the relationship before we even know each other. And then we begin to get to know each other and find out we don't really have all that much in common that we don't even like each other. <laughs> and eventually the relationship skews to the point where we break apart. God never intended that. What is it, what is it about? Why, why, is it, why does God teach it? Because he, God created you and I. He created you and I for love and, and, and to have that bond, to have that special relationship, friends. But we have to remember that the, the relationship begins, and we've talked about this, the four different types of love. There are four words in the Greek that are expressions of love. The first is eros. We get our word erotic from that, and we turn that into a sort of a dirty word. Eros, though, friends, is I am attracted to you. Whether it's a physical attraction, I find you physically attractive, or I find something that you do it, it does something for me. It, it excites me. And I'm attracted to you, Eros. And, we, and that's the beginning of the relationship. That's the beginning of that courtship, that relationship. And then the next, the next phase is philos. We get our word Philadelphia from that, the city of brotherly love. Philos, I have things in common with you. And as the relationship begins to blossom, friends, that, that philos, that, hey, I really like spending time with you. We enjoy the same things. We think we finish each other's sentences even because we have that connection. We have that thing in common, see. And as the relationship even progresses further, you begin to make that commitment and say, this is a lifelong commitment that I want to make with this person because we have such in common and we have this arrows, we have philos. And so what we do next is we make that connection for storge. Storge 
is a familial connection. I love you because we are related. But as the Christian, friends, there's a fourth kind of love. Because you see, those three other kinds of love are things that I get. See, Eros, I get something from Eros. I get something from Philos. I get something from Storge. And if that's all there is, when I stop getting what I want, I sever the relationship. And so the fourth kind of love, friends, is agape. Agape love can only be expressed by God. And so the only way that you and I can express the love of God is to be indwelled with the Holy Spirit and allow Him to express it through us. Agape love, friends, has no conditions. It is, it is a decision. It is a lifelong decision. And love, friends, is a decision. Make no mistake about it. You don't fall in love and you don't fall out of love. It is a decision. And for you and I as, as Christians, we are commanded to love one another as Jesus has loved us. And for that marriage relationship, friends, it is a lifelong bond that must be maintained regularly by a selflessness. A selflessness. Make no mistake. Agape must be prevalent in that relationship, in every one of our relationships, but particularly the most intimate of relationships. And once all of those things are in play, then we consummate the relationship physically. And when that happens, friends, the mind does not wander into the realm of what's being spoken of here where we begin to view other people and we begin to visualize ourselves with other people. Why do we do that? Because we've lost the connection. Because we're not getting what we feel like we need and what we want from the relationship that we're in. Should never get there. Should never get there. Well, I've run down that path and perhaps many of you are saying, <laughs> Pastor Doug, you're out of touch. I don't have any struggle with that. But what's he talking about? He's talking about the noetic effects of sin and lust. Lust is not just sexual lust, friends. Lust is the desire for things that I want, and I have to have them, and I have to have them now, and I have to do whatever I need to do to get them. Looking at survey, <coughs> a recent survey of discipleship journal readers ranked areas of greatest spiritual challenge to them. In lust, number one, go figure, materialism. Perhaps we don't struggle with sexual lust. Perhaps we do struggle with materialism, the desire to have nice things. When we look at other folks and they have nice things and we look at our bank account and we see that we don't have the wherewithal to afford those nice things and immediately we're envious of what they have. Or we desire things that we want. You know, and we're bombarded with this materialism. It's a societal norm. Right? Keep up with the Joneses. That's, that's a, like a metaphorical statement, isn't it? Oh, well, we got to get out. The Joneses got a boat. We can, if they, the, hey, if the Joneses can afford a boat, we can afford a boat. Right? Materialism, number one. Number two, pride. Oh, friends. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a statement in Proverbs. Proverbs, there, there are quite uh, a number of wise statements. Pride, pride goeth before a fall. What is pride? Pride is the idea that I know best. And that if everyone would just listen to me, everything would be well. Or, hey, you can't tell me anything. I know everything. Don't tell me that. And we reason in our mind that we know things and that everyone else doesn't. Friends, no man is an island. Every one of us needs a mentor, someone who's walked where we've walked, someone who has trodden where we're about to go, that, we, that can speak into our lives with wisdom. And we need the humility to recognize that no matter where we are, in our life, whether we're 15 or 50 or 90, <laughs> we, 
We need people that are more wise than we are speaking into our lives. That takes humility to take advice from others, doesn't it? Particularly in America where we think, hey, I've got all the information available to me. You look at the, we've got the internet. If I need to check anything, I just have the answers here. And I just believe whatever I want to believe. And that and whatever makes sense to me works, right? That's a postmodern worldview, by the way. Not a biblical worldview. God is immutable. He never changes. He was, he is, and he always will be the same. You want spiritual grounding? There's a book that God wrote. He'll help you with that. But friends, we have to, we have to swallow our pride in order to alter our lives. Pride, number two. Number three, self-centeredness. There's another twist off of that, that's self-centricness. Self-centeredness is that I'm the center of the universe and every action and every decision that I make, everything that I do is to benefit myself. And if it doesn't benefit me, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it. Hey, everybody else is that way. If you don't fend for yourself, if you don't fight for yourself, nobody else will, right? Is that what believers do? We're a community, friends, but even if that's true, even if that's true, you and I are to give and give and give until it hurts. Self-centeredness. Self-centricness is I operate from my own perspective. And from my own vantage point, I take everything into consideration that's going on from my vantage point, And I take action and I, I take concern only with what affects me. Number four. Oh, no. Laziness. We don't struggle with that, do we? We're out there, knees and elbows and everything, doing all to the glory of God 100% of the time, right? Number four, laziness. There's a tie for number five, and it's between the two things that we've talked about this week and last week. The tie is between anger and bitterness and sexual lust. That's number, that's number four and number, number five and number five tie. Number seven, envy. We talked about that. What's envy? There's a difference between jealousy and envy. Jealousy is I'm concerned that someone else is going to get something that I believe is mine. Envy is I want something that somebody else has. I'm envious that they have something that I don't have. Number eight, we don't really struggle with this in America. Gluttony. Number eight, gluttony. And number nine, lying. Lying. Do we struggle with that? Do we struggle with the truth? When, when the truth would be better, do we hide the truth? Why? Because we're ashamed. Or because perhaps we have so much pride that we think, well, I need to put on airs that I'm more than I really am. Or are we doing things in the dark shadows back over here that we don't want to portray to those in our lives. Or perhaps we're just a habitual exaggerator. You know, oh, well, it's just a white lie, right? Or maybe perhaps we just, we just withhold part, part of the story that paints a different picture. But that's not really lying, is it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Lying was number nine. So the sur listen, the survey respondents noted temptations were more potent when they, here's how to avoid it, neglected their time with God. 81% said that they were more apt to be tempted to fall into these nine areas of struggle, stumbling blocks, when they had neglected their time with God. And when they were physically tired. So guess what, friends? Getting a good night's rest helps us avoid sin. Resisting temptation was accomplished by, go figure, prayer. Spending time with the Lord. You know what prayer is, right? It's a dialogue with God. It's not a monologue from you to God saying, oh, I've got my laundry list of things that I need you to do for me, Lord. I know you're all powerful, so I need this, I need that, I need that. That's not prayer, is it? Prayer is a, is a conversation with the Lord where you're listening and talking by prayer. 84% said temptations were less potent when they kept their prayer life vibrant. Go figure. 
Avoiding compromising situations. 76% of those surveyed said that it was easier for them to avoid temptations when they just didn't go there. <laughs> That's kind of common sense, don't you think? You ever thought about that, though? I mean, it is, we're, we're in these compromising situations, and we find ourselves just stumbling over and over and over again, and then we cry out to God and say, Oh, God, forgive me. I'm sorry I've done it again. Instead of removing ourselves from, from the situation. Just don't go there. It kind of reminded me as I was looking at this, as, a, as an aside, you all remember that I ran a karate school for a number of years, and one of the techniques, self-defense techniques, is called a void technique. You know what that void technique is? Just don't be there. <laughs> if, if you want to avoid getting attacked, don't be there. <laughs> and that's what this is, friends. Just avoid those circumstances. Plug it out, cut it off, remove it, as painful as it may be. 66% said that Bible study, regular Bible study, immersing yourself in the Word, helped them to avoid temptation. And being accountable to someone was a prominent way for folks to avoid temptation. Why? Because if you're accountable to someone, you're reporting to them all your actions and all your activities. And there are, there are a number of pastors that I know that have a, an accountability buddy. I have accountability partners in my life that I communicate with regularly. But there, some will go to the point where there's like this net nanny that, that looks at everything that they do on their smartphone and on their computer and everything just to keep them in, in the straight and narrow. And you know what? That, that's twofold because that's a step out in testimony to their, to their flock. But it's, a, but it's an accountability situation with an accountability partner. Friends, you and I, no man is an island. You and I, whether we like it or not, are accountable to each other. So let's hold each other accountable. Let's, let's have someone speaking into our life with wisdom. So what is temptation? You know, I, I've had people come to me and ask me, you know, if, if I'm tempted, am I committing a sin? Well, the text tells us that Jesus was tempted yet without sin. Being tempted, friends, is not in itself sin. What is temptation? Well, it's seduction to evil. It's solicitation to doing wrong. It stands distinguished from trials. You see, the Lord will give you and I trials in our life. He will try us. And sometimes we pass the trial, other times we don't. But the trial are tests that seek to us to discover our moral qualities or our character. But temptation, friends, persuades us to evil. It deludes us that we may fall into ruin. So the one means to undeceive. A trial would be to undeceive us, reveal to us the enemy involved in our life. And the other would be to deceive us in order to have us to fall into sin. The one aims at the man's good, making him conscious of his true moral self, but the other at his evil, leading him to more unconsciousness of sin. There's a mini consciousness where we just fall into those circles where we just repeatedly do over and over again, playing that same scenario over and over again because of the noetic effects of sin. So perhaps you say in your mind, you know, Pastor Doug, I just, there's some things that I just struggle with. And I just feel like I just can't help myself. You ever heard anyone say that? I just couldn't help myself. Some of us are old enough to remember Flip Wilson <laughs> and the Flip Wilson comedy show. And he had this, he, would, he dressed up as this, uh, he, he, as this Geraldine. And, and Geraldine would, would be doing this or that. And then she'd say, the devil made me do it. Does the devil make us do anything? No, friends. The devil cannot make you do anything. You and I choose to do it. It's a choice. You, you, Jesus was tempted. Jesus was tempted, yet without sin. And 1 Corinthians 10, 13 gives us the confidence that that's true when it says this. Listen, this is important. No temptation has overtaken you, 
but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will provide the means of escape also so that you may be able to endure it. What does that tell us, friends? Well, first it tells us that, temp that temptation is predictable. In other words, you're not enduring anything that hadn't been endured before. It also tells us that there's a provision. God is making a provision to be with you. And it's preventable. It's escapable. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will provide the means of escape so you may be able to endure it. There's a way out of temptation every time. And so, friends, there's an accountability to that. Why? Because if there was a way out, you could have taken the way out. You could have taken the way out. So do we do this by our own willpower? Is this, is this something that you and I do by our will? If it is, what? Then it's will worship. So how do we do it? How do we do it? Well... In a scene from John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, he portrays this interpreter bringing Christian to a wall where a fire is blazing from a grate. And there's a man who's trying to douse the fire out with water. But the fire's not going out. Christian is perplexed. And then he's taken around to see the other side of the wall where there's another one that's fueling the fire with oil. He's fueling with oil. And so the interpreter says, You saw the man standing behind the wall to maintain the fire, teaching you that it's hard for the tempted to see how this work of grace is maintained in the soul. Satan tries to quench our faith, friends. But it's kept alive because of your and my new nature. It is done through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? So Jesus reminds his listeners that adultery is a sin. But he goes further to say that even if you look upon a woman lustfully, you've already committed that sin in your heart. And so he exhorts his audience to say, if there's something in your life that's causing you to stumble, remove it. Remove it. Take it out of your, your life completely, no matter how painful it is. If you're stumbling because of that, or this, or that thing, or whatever, or whoever, no matter how painful, remove it. So what's our takeaway? What do we do? How do, how do, we, how do we manage this? Well, here's a story, it's a true story. In the Australian bush country grows this little plant called the sundew. It has a slender stem and a tiny round set of leaves fringed with hairs that glisten with bright drops of liquid, as delicate as fine dew. But woe to the insect that dares to dance on it. Although its attractive clusters of red, and white, and pink blossoms are harmless, the leaves are deadly. The shiny moisture on each leaf is sticky and will imprison any bug that touches it. And as an insect struggles to free itself, the vibration causes the leaves to close tightly around it. And this innocent looking plant then feeds on its victim. And friends, that's the way sin is. It draws you in with the attraction, the allure of this beauty, of this beautiful thing. And then it begins to tighten its grip on you until it crushes you. If your right eye offends you, pluck it out. If your right hand offends you, cut it off. Remove it. Remove the temptation. Don't sit there and say, I'm strong enough to endure it. Take it away. You know, and we, we think we're particularly because of who we are in America. We were, we're, we're the greatest country in the history of history. That's, that's what we tout ourselves as. And so that, with that comes this, this ego about we can accomplish. You know, mom and dad said this. Hey, if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. 
And so we believe that we can overcome it in our own will. And even if we do, that's will worship, but we can't, friends. It's the idea, it's the, it's the parable of the boiling frog. What's the parable of the boiling frog? Well, if you put a frog in a, a pot of boiling water, if you toss that frog in the, and it's boiling, he'll jump out. It's hot. But if you put that frog in a lukewarm pot of water and you just slowly turn up the heat just a little bit at a time, it just boils his brain and the rest of his, of his organs all very, very slowly. Don't be victimized by the parable of the boiling frog, friends. Satiety, friends, will drag us down into its muck and mire gradually and slowly. And before we know it, we're down in the muck. We're stuck. I want to challenge us this week. Consider if there's anything in your life right now that's causing you to stumble into sin. And if there is, I want you to write it down and I want you to pray to the Lord that he help you remove it, whatever it is, no matter how painful it is. Will you do that and honor the Lord? Let's pray. Father, thank you for these that are gathered here for this message, for all your purposes and all your will, Lord. I pray that you give us the strength of the Spirit to accomplish your purposes, that you would fill us with that spirit. Be with us, guide and direct us. We praise you and thank you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray, amen. amen. We come now to a time of invitation. And the reason that we have this invitation time is to provide people with the opportunity to honor the Lord in the way that he said. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You, we, must, we must confess with our mouth. We must profess that, that Christianity to others. We must stand before men and women and say, yes, I believe that Jesus is who he says he is, that he did what he said he would do, and by that and that alone, salvation is mine. You stand before men and women and do that. Why? Because... You're a changed being. You're a new creation in Christ. If, you, if you've experienced that this morning, I want to challenge you to come forward and do that and stand before men and women. If you want to unite with this beautiful body of believers, Woodland Trails, the loving church, you come forward as we sing our invitation hymn.